Uh, tonight we'll be in the book of Acts chapter 15. I heard the story of a worship leader and the pastor of the church having an ongoing conflict. And no, I'm not talking about Hans and Pastor Greg. But one week the pastor decided to press his position by preaching on commitment and how people need to be flexible in ministry. In defiance to that message, the worship leader ended the service with the hymn, I shall not be moved. Well, the next Sunday, the pastor preached on giving and how we should gladly give to the work of the Lord. The worship leader led in the song, Jesus paid it all. The next Sunday, the pastor preached on gossiping and how we should watch our tongues. The hymn to that service at the end was, I love to tell the story. You can see this back and forth bantering that's going on here. Well, the pastor became disgusted over the whole situation. The next Sunday, he told the congregation he was considering resigning. The worship leader saying, oh, why not tonight? <laughs> so the pastor decided, I'm going to resign. So he, he, he was going to teach his last sermon that next week, and he preached. And he told his congregation that Jesus led him there. And Jesus was taking them away. The worship leader then saying, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> Conflict in the church. That's the title of our message tonight. It happens. It's unfortunate, but it does happen. Church feuds are not uncommon. In this church that we're going to be talking about tonight in Acts chapter 15, it's not been in existence for very long. But it doesn't take very long for a problem to arise, for a conflict to come up. They arose in several different ways, and we'll look at those together tonight. But although we're going to look at the, the entire chapter, we're not going to look at every single verse. 41 verses, we'll just do kind of a flyover of the, of the, of the, of the message of the scriptures tonight, the chapter 15. And I'll let you get into your groups and do some of the heavy lifting there. Uh, we're going to have six points tonight. Um, I like to alliterate my messages. It helps me to remember the points. And so we're going to be using uh, the, the letter D. So tonight's sermon is sponsored by the letter D. And uh, those of you who are laughing uh, probably have young kids who watch Sesame Street. Uh, sorry for that reference. But our first point tonight is we're going to look at is the dissenters. The dissenters. Verse 1. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren... Unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, in chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas had just finished coming through their first missionary journey. And they were celebrating, and it was a great time, and they were thanking the Lord. And in verse 27 of, of, of chapter 14, it said, They gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. They were so rejoicing, this victory that had been won. But as they experience a victory, know that on the heels of that, many times comes opposition. It happens in our own lives. We, we have this victory, this mountaintop experience that, that the Lord gives to us. And it's a great time where we're rejoicing in Jesus, that we come down the mountain and, and all of a sudden opposition comes. This happens quite often. And we read in our first verse, certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren. On the surface, that, thing, that would be a good thing. They're coming from Jerusalem, they're coming up from Judea, and now they're going to teach the brethren there. You know, at Harvest, there's times when, when Pastor Greg is at a crusade and he's, he's out of the pulpit. He'll bring people from other uh, areas, uh, James McDonald from Chicago, Alistair Begg from Cleveland. James Merritt from Atlanta. These people come and they teach the word of God. Unfortunately, these men were not there to teach the word of God correctly. The church started in Jerusalem. Now teachers were arriving on the scene. But the problem is what they were teaching. And Paul and Barnabas, they had come just in time to deal with these dissenters. As the Jewish teachers came up, they were teaching a false doctrine. Jesus plus circumcision. The believers were too inexperienced. They were new believers. They, they didn't know. And so they were too inexperienced to refute this teaching. So they just kind of went along with it. But Paul and Barnabas were there to, to kind of put on the brakes. We, we need to also remember that the apostle Paul himself was thought of as a false brethren when he received Christ alone for his salvation. Many of the believers didn't believe it. 
They thought this has got to be a ploy for Paul to get in there and work his way through the, the church to be able to continue to persecute them. But we know Barnabas came alongside of him, took him under his wing, mentored him. And, and Paul was a true believer in Christ. But these guys, they're false brethren. They're false teachers that come in. And we need to realize here, guys, is that this really is the gospel that's under question at this council. The Judaizers of that day are different than the liberals of today. The liberal will actually deny the facts of the gospel where these Judaizers twisted it in a, in a sense. They, it, was, it was salvation, but it was a twist to it. These, they were saying, in order to be saved, you have to believe in Jesus and you have to be circumcised. Jesus plus works equals salvation. That was their message. Jesus plus circumcision equals salvation. Jesus plus baptism equals salvation. Jesus plus communion equals salvation. And the fact of the matter is, the gospel is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And that's the message that they needed to hear. And that was why Paul and Barnabas were there, to correct this false teaching. I like the fact of our memory verse this week, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of our own doing. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone could boast. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. It's not anything that we've done. It's a, a gift of God, a free gift of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's not a result of works or anything that we've done. If that were the case, we could boast. So you're saved. How'd you get saved? Well, I walked four little old ladies across the street. I gave some money to this homeless guy. I did this thing over here, and I did this thing over there, and, and that's how I got to be saved. Well, what'd you do? We, we, we'd, we'd be able to boast about it. Not only that, it, it diminishes the cross. If it was works-based, then why did Jesus even go to the cross? But it's, 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 salvation is just simply Jesus alone. And, and it says that, that we are his workmanship. In the Greek, that word is, is poema. We are his poem. We are his work of art. And so we are created by God for good works. So we're not saved by good works, but because we are saved, we do good works. That's the whole epistle of James. So the problem was with the false teachers and the false doctrine. The possibilities, it could have been a fatal division. But what was the plan? To find direction. We come to our second point in verses 2 through 4, the declaration. Verse 2. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about the question. So in being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the, con the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. This is the first of three times that we're going to read in this chapter that no small dissension happened. In other words, a big blowout occurred. And there are certain things that we as Christians, when we disagree with other Christians, we can still hold on to theological soundness. For example, some people believe once saved, always saved, eternal security. Others believe you can lose your salvation. Uh, some believe in the fact of the gifts of the Spirit are for today. Some believe that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. Some believe in the rapture position of, of a, a, a pre-tribulation uh, rapture or, or a mid-tribulation -tribula rapture or a post-tribulation rapture. Uh, which of those are right? Guys, those are what we call non-essential doctrines. Non-essential doctrines in the sense of this. Um, they're not going to divide us. If we're having a cup of coffee and we're describing some of these things and we're debating them friendly, we're not going to leave the table and, and, and get out. We're, we're two brothers talking about this in Christ. But there are some essential doctrines which we do break fellowship over with those who don't believe some of those things. What are they? Well, the deity of Christ. 
that Jesus is God, the virgin birth, the incarnation of Christ, that, that God became a man, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, etc., etc. So those are the essentials. If a person doesn't believe any one of those things, they're not truly saved. They're not truly a Christian. Those are Christian doctrines. It's salvation by grace through faith that was being defended here. So Paul and Barnabas believed this. They debated this. They argued this. They disputed this with the false teachers. Then they said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to take this to a higher authority. We're going to go back to Jerusalem where the apostles are, where the elders are, and let's see what they have to say. So that's what they did. So they, they decided to go to this, uh, down to Jerusalem. And it wasn't just uh, the next city over. It wasn't just a few miles you know, to the south. It was a 250-mile journey. So this was no small feat. But the great thing about it is they were able to go to some of the cities and, and tell them of the good news to the Gentiles that Jesus saves and that they too can be saved. They took advantage of this unplanned journey. In the same way, there's going to be times in our lives when things happen that, that make us go off the course of our normal everyday activities and, and have us do something maybe a little different. Maybe we forgot that we need to renew our license so we're going to find ourselves in the DMV line tomorrow. God help you if that's you tonight. Or if you, your wife calls you and says, hey, on the way home, can you go to the store and grab me this or grab me that? Or maybe it's a, a phone call and says, listen, we need to come back to the doctor. We just don't know where this, this journey is going to take us. But wherever it takes us, we should be like Paul and Barnabas, bringing the message of joy wherever we, we go. So they finally make their way down to Jerusalem, and they're told uh, that the apostles, and they told the apostles and the elders of their experiences with the Gentiles. And our third point tonight is the discussion. The discussion in verses 5 through 18. We're not going to read all the verses, but let's read uh, verse 5 together. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now before, back in Antioch, all they said is, listen, they need Jesus plus circumcision. Now they're adding another variable to the equation. It's now Jesus plus plus circumcision, plus the law of Moses. And this mathematical equation keeps getting longer and longer. And they weren't just speaking about the Ten Commandments. They were talking about all of the law of Moses, all the dietary laws, all the cultural laws. They were talking about that as a complete package. The New Testament never argues that Christians shouldn't pay attention to the Ten Commandments, though we know that it never leads us to salvation. The argument was not about that. It dealt with the ritualistic practices of the Jews, which set them apart from other people. Circumcision, food laws, guidelines for living, etc. And so then they had this council, this Jerusalem council that it's called. They were all brought together. In verse 6, the apostles and the elders came together to consider the matter. And when there had been much dispute, there's our second conflict, much disputing, so they're, they're all there gathered together saying, listen, uh, we have to be circumcised as Jews. They should be, have to be circumcised as Jews as well. Uh, as, as these new Gentiles coming in to become Jews, then they can become Christians. Yes, Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, we believe that. Yes, he came to save our sins. But he, we're also supposed to be doing these things. And we're to be keeping the law of Moses. So this big dissension ends up being uh, there at the Jerusalem council. But then someone gets up and starts to speak, and it's Peter. And Peter is very well respected. Uh, Peter is an apostle. Uh, Peter is someone who's, who's been with Jesus himself. And P Peter rose up and said, and he gave his dissertation. The fact that, they had, that the Gentiles had received the Spirit, just as Peter and the Jewish Christians, was proof that God had accepted the Gentiles on equal footing. And Peter's saying, listen... Don't put a, a, a burden on these people. Don't put a, a yoke of burden, an undue yoke that these Gentiles have, now have to keep. Uh, don't, don't make them be circumcised and follow the law of Moses because then it's no longer you know, grace alone, faith alone. And Peter was bringing this point to their knowledge. Peter preached the same thing, saved by the grace of the Lord. And as Peter got up to speak, he was a Jew of the Jews. He was narrow-minded in a good way. 
He himself had never eaten anything unclean. He wouldn't have entered the house of a Gentile. He, he stuck as close to the Mosaic law as anybody could. So when Peter spoke up, they were definitely going to listen, and they did. Does Peter say that God purified their hearts by keeping the law? No. By going through a ritual? No. By becoming a member of a church? No. By faith is how we come. Peter said, I went into the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. I gave them the facts of the gospel. They believed, they were saved, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and just as they did with them, so is it with us as Jews. And Peter, he hits it right in the heart of the matter. He says that they didn't keep the law, and your fathers didn't keep the law. Why should you expect them to keep the law if you yourself can't even keep the law? God doesn't save people by keeping the law. Do you know why? No one can keep the law. No one can keep the law perfectly. God saves on one basis and one basis only. Faith in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. In verse 11 it says, But we believed that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they were. Peter puts it very plainly. The gospel is very plain. The Jews must be saved in exactly the same way that the Gentiles are saved. He implies, I'm not saved because I don't eat pork. I'm saved because I've trusted Christ. He is saved by the grace of God. In verse 12, all the multitudes, they just bit their tongue. They kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them and among the Gentiles. Peter stands up, gives his dissertation. He sits down. Paul and Barnabas get up and say, let me tell you guys what happened in our first missionary journey. All of the miracles that the Lord was doing was amazing. And they start telling this, these folks what God did through them, through the power of the Holy Spirit, laying the hands on them. Paul himself being stoned really to death and raising again. I mean, God did so many works. And so Paul and Barnabas get into the act and tell them all that the Lord has done. They sit down. James stands up. And James starts now telling his part of the story. He gives his take on that. James has been in, in, in Jerusalem. And by the way, who is this James that we're referring to here? Because we know that there's James and John in the Gospels, the sons of thunder. And, but we also remember, if you've been with us, that in, in chapter 12, uh, James was beheaded by Herod. And so obviously this is not that James, the James and John, the sons of thunder. This is James who wrote the epistle of James. And it's interesting that he's talking that it's not about works that were saved because later on in his epistle, he makes that very clear about works and faith. But this is James, the half-brother of Jesus. This is Jesus' half-brother. He, he was uh, one of the elders and he was the authority figure in Jerusalem. But Peter's words, he was, James was saying, listen, because Peter's words lined up with, with God's word then we, we should be believing that. It, it's important to know that because if the words spoken in this pulpit don't match up to with the word of God, then something's not right. And it's not that something's not right with the word of God. It's something's not right with the pe person teaching the pulpit. As a person who gets up and says, I have a revelation from the Lord. Anytime I hear that, I, I cringe. I think, what's this, gonna, what's this person going to say? I have a revelation from the Lord. Jesus was born, he, he, he lived a perfect life, he died a perfect death, he rose again on the third day, and he's on the right hand of the Father. Hey, I can agree with that, because it says that in the Bible. But the man that gets up in the pulpit and says, I have a new revelation from the Lord. There are no longer three persons of the Trinity. There are nine persons of the Trinity. Three persons of the Father, three persons of the Son, and three persons of the Holy Spirit. And we laugh a little bit about that. But a person actually said that. A false teacher got up there, was on TV, and said that exact, those exact words. Doesn't line up in my Bible. I don't know what Bible he's reading from. So anytime you hear someone say, I have a, a revelation from the Lord, be careful. Be like Paul says to Timothy, uh, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman uh, that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what now is the decision? What's the decision that, that these, uh, this council made in verse 19 through 21? Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, 
but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted to idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses had thoroughly many generations those who preached him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Conflict requires give and take, or conflict resolution should anyway. It's give and take. It's not by, by digging my heels in and, and, and then not uh, allowing the other party to at least hear their case. James is saying this. Listen, what I'm telling you guys is, is it's, it's by Jesus alone. But since they are Gentiles and we don't want to offend our Jewish brothers, let's tell them not to uh, you know, have any sexual immorality, not to eat any blood that's been offered to idols. Don't eat any meat that has been uh, strangled. You know, the, the animal is strangled so the blood stays in the meat. Let's have them do those things so we don't offend our Jewish brothers. It was kind of a give and take. The, the, the part about, you know, the gospel is by grace alone. That was an adamant, uh, you know, fact of, of what was to happen in this Jerusalem council. And, and then they were taking that letter to it. So once they, they decided on that, now they needed to send the letter out. And that's our next point, the delegation. The delegation in verses 22 through 35. In verse 22 it says, Then it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And they wrote this letter. And in the letter it says the same things that we just heard from James. They explained what had happened and what transpired in Jerusalem to the other churches to instruct, instruct them in proper doctrine and also not to stumble their Jewish brothers. And in verse 30, it says that when they're continuing now in ministry, so they were sent off, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. As they were reading the letters to the churches, they're thinking, oh, this is great. We are saved by grace through faith alone. We don't have to be circumcised. They're probably really thankful on that one. And, uh, but yet that this was the truth of what came from the council. When they had read it, it says in verse 30 and 31, they rejoiced for the encouragement. There is encouragement and there is comfort in the gospel. There is nothing but condemnation in the law. The law condemns. The law is like a mirror. I look in this mirror and I see, oh my goodness, I am a wretched man. I am worthless. I am a sinner. I am wretched. That's what the law does for me. It shows me my sin. It shows me that I fall short of God's glory. But the gospel says, come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, I'll give rest to your soul. Come to me for your salvation. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He'll save you by his grace. That is a great comfort. If the chapter would end here, that would end on a good note. This is great. Everything's going well. We hear all about grace of God and that there's not about works. Let's just stop right here, right now. But the chapter continues on. And our last point this evening is the division. The division, verses 36 through 41. You might recall in uh, chapter 13, uh, during their first missionary journey, it was, it was Paul and Barnabas, and Barnabas wanted to take his young cousin John Mark with him. And so off they went, and they had this wonderful missionary journey where they were preaching the gospel, people were getting saved. But make no mistake, it was tough. It was hard. They were being persecuted. They were being stoned. And John Mark, when they entered a, a town called Pamphylia, says, you know, guys, I'm out. You know, this is too hard for me. I'm heading back to Jerusalem. That's what he did. In Acts 13, 13, it says that John Mark went back, he de departed and went back to Jerusalem. And then Paul and Barnabas continued on in the missionary journey, ending the first one. And then we read about uh, all that happened in Acts chapter 15. Now we're going to start the second missionary journey of Paul. And so now they were, this is great. I can't, we have this letter. We're good to go. Let's go on our second missionary journey. Let's go and visit all the churches that we were able to establish when we went on our first missionary journey. Barnabas is absolutely great idea. You know, we'll start out what we did before. We'll continue on. Hey, hey John, Mark, we're going to go over to the second missionary journey. Paul says, he ain't going with us. So what do you mean he's not going with us? He's not going. We, we, he left us when we were back in Pamphylia. I don't want to babysit. This is a loose paraphrase. And uh, he was just telling him, I'm not going to, to have that happen to us again. Barnabas says, oh, well, if he's not going, then I'm not going. It's like, bye. 
And it says here, it tells us that, that, the, that the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. This is our third dissension that we see within the chapter 15 of the book of Acts. Sometimes in ministry, things like this happen. It was, it was so, they, they couldn't agree on it. I'm not taking John Mark with me. Then I'll take him. Fine, go. I'll take Silas with me. And that's exactly what happened. So who was right? Was Paul right? Was Barnabas right? We're not told. But it's not about who's right. It's about what's right. And what happened here is God allowed that to happen. And through that, two ministries took off and split out of one. Now, this isn't always the case, uh, and we don't know who was to blame necessarily for it, but what we do see is the action that followed it. More ministry took place. It's been said before, to dwell above with the saints we love, oh, that will be such glory. But to live below with the saints we know, well, that's a different story. It's true. So in conclusion, we see the conflicts, three conflicts that arose in the church. First being false teachers. Guys, we cannot tolerate aberrant teaching, false teachers, heretical teaching. It just cannot be tolerated. It must be called out. They must be exhorted. Uh, several years ago, in watching Larry King live when the program was still on, there was a, a prominent pastor who was on that show. And uh, he was giving, you know, back and forth with Larry. He was asking him questions. Larry was asking him some very simple questions. And this man was the, the pastor of one of the largest churches in America, a very popular man. And when Larry was asking him about what must a person do to be saved, he was saying, well, you know, the Bible tells us this and that. He said, well, what about the Muslims? What about the Jewish people? Uh, how, how are they saved? He said, well, I don't, I don't know how that works. Um, all I know is, is that uh, my dad used to take me to India with him, and those people believe in a different God, and they love God, and who's to say they're not going to heaven? Jesus, I mean, the Bible, I mean, you know, these are like easy questions, and the guy's just like totally blowing it, saying, you know, pretty much anybody can be saved, doesn't matter who, what they believe, and this is a man who, who has a congregation of, of thousands and, and, the, and so the evangelical Christian church went to their blogs and, and went to their articles. And they wrote, you know, why, you know, it, it's through grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. And, uh, but I appreciated the fact that the, that one man, and I was talking to him, it was James Merritt uh, from, from Atlanta. He said, you know, I wrote him a letter. And I said, listen, um, if you need some assistance with doctrine, I'd be happy to sit down with you and disciple you and mentor you. I don't know if that ever happened, if you ever took him up on that. Um, but th that's, that's the reaction that, that's good in that sense. Uh, let's correct these, these false teachers. We can't, uh, you know, sweep it under the carpet. It's got to be dealt with. The second thing that we see here is you have to stand up for what you believe. Peter stood up and said, listen, I saw with my own eyes, I was led by the Spirit of God that the Gentiles can be saved. Peter stood up when there was much dispute over it. We need to be theologically sound ourselves. We need to make sure that we are, again, studying to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we do this by coming to Valor on a Tuesday night. I commend you guys for doing that. Uh, we have start to, to grow, start to serve. We have deepening your faith. We have all these ways of growing in your faith theologically so you can defend uh, when people ask you about your salvation and what it takes to be saved. Thirdly, and lastly, sometimes, sometimes, conflict comes from within the church. We have, uh, you know, uh, no small dissension with a brother at the church. This is what happened with Paul and Barnabas. You have to have convictions. Paul had convictions. John Mark wasn't going to slow them down. They were moving forward. Barnabas, the compassionate, the encourager, said, no, no, we got to bring this kid under our wings and let him try again. Again, I think both of those things are valid. But, but they have to make sure that they have their convictions and their convictions are strong. I remember hearing the story from John Wooden, uh, the great uh, basketball coach from UCLA, won uh, so many national championships. And a after they won one championship, uh, he allowed their, the guys to go out and, and just do their thing for the, the summer. But every time they came back to practice, they'd have to have short hair and no facial hair. Well, uh, one young man who led him to the championship the year before, Bill Walton, he came back 
to practice that very first practice with long hair and a beard. He says, Coach, you know, you told us that uh, it's important that we stand by our convictions. And it's my conviction that I should be able to have long hair and a beard. John Wooden says, you know what, Bill, I appreciate that. I can see that you're growing and as a man, this is a good thing. You have your convictions. And you know what? We're really going to miss you this year. <laughs> Pretty, you know, to the, to the point. And then uh, Bill Walton says, and so what I did, he says, listen, John Wooden says, you've got 15 minutes to uh, get a haircut and get back to practice if you want to play this year. So John, uh, Bill Walton says, I, I went on my bike, I pedaled as fast as I could from Westwood to the nearest barber, got a haircut, came back, I was five minutes late, hoping coach didn't see me. But he stood by his convictions. You know, there's sometimes here at Harvest, we see young men who, who have a real uh, Calvinistic bend, a real Reformed theology, and they want to uh, infiltrate, you know, our youth and say, Calvinism is the only way that, that is, the, is the right way. And so we just tell them, you know what? There are plenty of good churches that teach Calvinism, Reformed theology. Go there instead. Why, why come here and, and bring your convictions to us? We know what we believe and why we believe it. Go somewhere else and do those things. Sometimes we have contingents so great that we part ways. But I like the fact that we, it just doesn't leave us there. I wonder what happened to Barnabas. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9. He says he affectionately mentions Barnabas as being worthy of monetary support in his work in proclaiming the gospel. Even Paul in 2 Timothy said, and bring John Mark with you for he is useful to me. So even in those, those dissensions that we have, we still see this, this reconciliation that happens. So we see that conflicts in the church do happen, whether it's through false teachers, whether it's rising up theologically to make sure that the, what is teaching correct, or even with one another. But may it all be for the glory of God and the furtherance of the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather together as men who desire your word, because we know your word is truth. We know that's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to discern between the thoughts and intents of our hearts. We thank you that we can glean from your word in such a, a wonderful way that we'd apply it to our lives and keep the truth of your word in our hearts. I pray you bless these men as they go to their groups tonight, that they would uh, also bear one another's burdens, thus fulfilling the law of Christ, that they would pray for one another, that they would uphold one another, and that, God, that it would be for your glory and our good. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.